We're going to show you astonishing discoveries about tropical animals that are still unknown to most tropical biologists. These animals are all found in Central and South America, where tropical rainforests are so hot and wet that steam rises from them. Rainforests are called that for good reasons. Animals who live there are used to days with incessant rain, even though we find continuous rain difficult for photography. Most people find these forests so uncomfortable and dangerous that they have been called the green hell. About 500 years ago, the first European explorers who dared to enter these dark forests discovered many animals completely different from any known from the rest of the world. Among these strange insects are two fulgorid bugs that look dangerous, but are completely harmless. Among these insects were swarms of army ants. As far as their human eyes could see, the ground was covered by moving bodies of ants. It was easy to conclude that there must be millions of ants. We now know that each swarm has only 100,000 to 300,000 ants, but that's still a lot of ants. The people who have lived in these forests for thousands of years know that the forests are unsafe, especially at night. At night, the giant cats, the puma and the jaguar, prowl for food. Everyone is taught as a child that these big cats sometimes kill people. Night is also the time when venomous snakes are difficult to see when they are curled up on the forest floor. This fur de lance is common in tropical forests and quite capable of killing full-grown adults. When Europeans first arrived in the New World about 500 years ago, they did not understand the comings and goings of huge swarms of ants. One day, hundreds of thousands of ants would swarm over every surface. The next day, they were gone. No one knew why they left or where they went. It took a most unlikely person, a doctor of psychology from the heart of New York City, to have the courage to explore these forests at night for army ants. Dr. T.C. Schnarle came from the American Museum of Natural History in New York. He started his explorations of army ants about 75 years ago in 1932. At that time, an inexpensive battery-powered headlight had been invented. For 1932, this was a high-tech invention, and it made it possible to use both hands to pull aside and cut the dense vegetation to follow the ants. These battery headlights have become smaller and lighter, but are still essential pieces of field equipment for nighttime research in the tropics. Most people, even today, who live in or near tropical rainforests cannot afford flashlights or headlights. And if they are lucky enough to possess a flashlight, they are not going to waste the precious batteries looking for ants. Dr. Schnerla, however, was an energetic field scientist who was unafraid of the forest at night, and he became the first person to follow army ants during their nightly immigrations. In fact, he followed the same colony every night for over six weeks. He made many discoveries, and perhaps the most important is shown in this chart. On the left, you see the nomadic phase, when the colony emigrates about 100 meters every night for about two weeks. During the nomadic phase, the colony has an immense brood of over 100,000 larvae. That phase ends with the larvae complete their development and spin cocoons. When the brood is all in cocoons, the colony stops emigrating, and that time Dr. Schnerle called the statery phase. The statery phase lasts about three weeks. At the bottom of the chart, the slender queen becomes pregnant during the middle of the statery phase and lays the next brood of 100,000 eggs. Just as young worker ants are emerging from their cocoons, the next brood is hatching from eggs, and the colony starts the next nomadic phase. These alternating nomadic and statery phases have gone on continuously for millions of years. Imagine you have up to 700,000 siblings with whom you share a house, not a large home, not a place where you have your own space, but you live in close quarters, very close quarters. So close, you're constantly climbing over one another. Your mother just laid 100,000 eggs, one after the other, one by one. Your father left his sperm more than a year ago and then died. Moreover, your mother will lay 100,000 eggs every 35 days for her entire life. She doesn't care for them. You have to feed and care for the babies 24 hours of every day. Moreover, you have to move all those babies every night for two weeks or you will run out of nearby food. Lucky for you, the babies grow up in two weeks and then take a three-week break when they do not eat at all. After that, they will help, like you, with the work of the colony for the rest of their lives. Imagine further that you're blind, only about half an inch long, 
and required to go out every morning and search for any small living animal that you can kill. You do not do this alone, but in a swarm, like a pack of 50,000 miniature wolves. Since you are blind, you find your prey by taste, by smell, and by touch, using sense organs that are so phenomenally sensitive that we humans are only beginning to understand how you do it. These incredible animals are army ants in one species, Eseton burchellii. They first evolved more than 100 million years ago, roughly 99 million years before any animal resembling a human being appeared on this planet. They can only exist today because tropical forests have billions of small animals living in them. Most of these animals are smaller than your thumbnail. The really important predators on these animals are the army ants. The stars of this video are the swarm raiders, Eseton burchellii, the largest and most ferocious army ants in Central and South America. Among the swarm, there are a few much larger ants called majors or soldiers. The large, hook-like jaws on this soldier are used for defense of the colony. The dark spot on the side of the head is an eye. These ants will respond to light, but all worker army ants are blind. Just as people who lose their sight become much more aware of sounds and smells, army ants have evolved incredible sense organs to detect chemicals and vibrations. Army ants have evolved to become walking gas chromatographs, able to detect chemicals perhaps down to a single molecule. All army ants follow a chemical trail that the workers deposit as they walk. We cannot see or detect the trail and must use the ants to show us where it is. The ants use their antennae to detect the trail. This is the tip of one antenna of a worker army ant. We have estimated that there are over 5,000 sense organs on each antenna. If we could make one worker ant the length of an elephant, a part of one antennal segment would look like this. To date, we can only guess at the function of most of these microscopic structures. Each ant can distinguish one individual from its own colony from an ant of a different colony or species. The entire surface of an ant is incredibly complex with many different morphological features. Human skin, by comparison, appears primitive. Unlike most animals, ants don't chew with their jaws. The jaws or mandibles are for biting only. When we zoom in to the base of the jaws, we can see the tiny mouth parts that are used for eating. After a raid, colonies frequently emigrate at night when frogs and other animals call to one another. The ants carry the eggs, larvae, cocoons, and any leftover food to a new bivouac. Rush hour highway traffic is calm compared with an army ant column experienced in real time at the level of an ant. Perhaps it's an advantage for the army ants that they cannot see their neighbors and emigrate by touch and smell. The first biologists who watched army ant emigrations thought the soldiers were the generals directing the army. They swagger around, waving their giant jaws, and do no visible work. We now know they defend the colony, but most of the time they get in the way of the troops doing the real work of the army. Eseton burchellii is the only species of army ant that has the spectacular swarm raids you see here. Because the workers are only 11 millimeters, or about one half inch long, in order for you to see the ants, we must show you only a small part of a swarm raid. The front of a swarm can be 15 meters or almost 50 feet wide. We have never met anyone who is not somewhat terrified to be in front of such a swarm heading right toward them. An army ant swarm raid is one of the most impressive sights in any tropical forest. Tropical moist forests can have many colonies of Eseton burchellii and at least 15 other species of army ants. Each square meter of tropical forest is, on average, raided by army ants once a day. One of the most beautiful army ants is Noma Myrmex essenbeckii. You probably never considered that ants could be beautiful. Under a microscope, many ants shine like gemstones with ornate structures and complex textures. It's hard to study ants for years and not feel a certain pleasure in looking at their complex forms. The second swarm raiding army ant is this small ant, Labidus predator. Occasionally it has dense swarm raids that last usually for less than an hour on the surface of the ground. Most of its raiding and its emigrations occur underground. Its enormous colonies move through soil as easily as we move through the air. All army ants eat billions of tiny animals every week. A single large colony of Eseton burchellii can kill a half million animals per week. 
Unlike most ants and other animals that need to collect nesting materials, army ants construct nests from their own bodies. Only two species of army ants make such temporary nests, called bivouacs, above ground. Sometimes their nests are under a log or brush heap. Other bivouacs are between the buttresses of large trees. From a distance, the ants in a bivouac may look as though they're sleeping. If you poke your finger into a bivouac, scores of ants instantly bite and sting. Ouch! The biggest workers or soldiers were the first surgical staples. Thousands of years ago, Native Americans in Central and South America discovered that these giant jaws could be used to close a severe wound. The ants readily bite wherever they are placed. The bite hurts like pinpricks. It is the sting on the other end of the body, injecting venom, that is painful. Stings are not deadly unless you happen to be allergic to the venom. The body is easily pulled off, leaving the head that continues to bite. The heads will stay attached and appear to be alive for over 12 hours as the antennae keep waving. The heads can stay on clothing for weeks, even after clothes go through washers and dryers. The jaws must be spread apart to remove them, making them ideal sutures. We have never had a bite become infected and wonder if the ants provide an antibiotic. The outer wall of the bivouac shows many ants hanging downward. The first ant hangs onto a support by the claws on her hind legs, and the following ant hooks her legs onto the front claws on the legs of the first ant. Since their jaws are not being used, they're free to bite. Army ants have long and very strong legs, and one ant can hold up more than a hundred others. When the ants leave on a raid or emigration, you can see long strings of ants hooked together by the claws on the ends of their legs. Other ants can readily run over these strings. Inside a bivouac, the larvae are a jumbled mass constantly being rearranged by the adults. Prey is dumped on the larvae as the workers bring it into the bivouac. A beetle occasionally runs through the bivouac. The larvae are all about the same age. The biggest larvae will become majors or soldiers. The smallest larvae develop into tiny workers. Unlike people, once a worker ant becomes an adult, she no longer grows in size. Like bees and social wasps, all worker ants are females. Within the bivouac, there are also many insects besides ants. Silverfish, or Thysanura, spend much time cleaning the surfaces of larvae or adult ants. Perhaps this is beneficial for the ants. It's not essential, since the adult ants do the same thing. Roars of howler monkeys usually greet dawn in a tropical forest. On many mornings in Ecuador, we were awakened at 5.45 by the most spectacular calls of the laughing falcon. Although the deaf army ants cannot hear these sounds, the first sign of daylight seems to trigger the start of raiding. Army ants begin their day's activities by pouring out from the bivouac. Between 50,000 and 300,000 ants pour out in a few hours. You can see why Esseton burchellii is called a swarm raider. The ants swarm over and under almost all leaves, logs, and anything else in their path. They swarm up some tree trunks, but ignore others. Each surface is covered thoroughly. Many people staring at birds discover army ants only after the ants have crawled up their legs and have started to bite and sting. If you stand in their way, they will swarm onto you. If you stamp your feet to get them off, you'll attract more ants. But if you stand still, the ants turn back towards their better hunting grounds. You or any healthy vertebrate animal can walk away from the ants unharmed. Many ant birds follow the front of the swarm raid. They do not eat the ants, but feed on prey escaping from them. If you watch this male spotted ant bird closely, you will see that the ants run over the bird's feet without stopping or trying to bite. As many as 15 individuals of this species of ant bird have been seen at a single swarm raid. The calls of birds often attract people to the swarm raids. The swarms are great places for bird watching as the birds ignore people while darting after food. If you live in a house that's near to where army ants live, you will learn to welcome a raid. The ants will forage just as thoroughly inside your home as they do outside. It's impossible to even think you can keep them out. They can run up vertical walls and across ceilings. 
One raid killed over 300 paper wasps inside one room in a house in Costa Rica. The ants can form a living rope from your dining table to the floor. They will find any crack or opening and pour in by the thousands. The ants will discover more species in your house than you ever imagined lived there. This wonderful pest control is a service provided free of charge by the army ants who do not leave any insecticide residues. Scorpions are commonly present, but not welcome, in tropical human homes. The army ants quickly chase them. Some escape to the outdoors, where they are often killed by the ants, but this mother was lucky to escape with her babies. The largest cockroach in the world, Blaborus giganteus, is almost three inches or eight centimeters long. It's a frequent, uninvited resident of human homes. The ants will chase this roach out of hiding, but do not eat it. We think it has some chemical ant repellent. The fly landing on the cockroach's back is Calodexia, one of more than 50 kinds of flies that accompany swarm raids. Unlike many flies, this fly does not lay eggs. The eggs hatch within the female, and the fly drops active larvae on the host cockroach, where they bore inside and begin feeding. Other, smaller cockroaches are frequently attacked and torn apart in seconds. This was a cockroach a few seconds earlier. A strawberry dendrobated frog jumps in the wrong direction and is immediately attacked and killed in spite of the poisons in its skin. People use these frog poisons on darts for hunting. The ants try to pull the whole frog. However, the ants cannot cut its skin and abandon the dead frog to some other creature. Small lizards run to escape the ant swarm, and they may catch a few insects also escaping. An anoa lizard jumps right into the swarm. It appears dead, but springs to life. The attack continues, and the lizard is killed by the ant's stings. The army ants are able to feed on only a small amount of lizard blood oozing through the skin, but they are incapable of cutting the skin or tearing apart the lizard. While the ants are still attacking, flies arrive. A flesh fly, or sarcophagid, is approached by a jumping spider that decides against attacking it. Flesh flies accompany the army ant swarm raids, and here one of these lays eggs in this small dead lizard. We reared six specimens of one species of sarcophagid fly from this lizard. When the army ants come upon this boa constrictor, they treat the snake like a log and run over it without attacking. The snake shows no sign of noticing the ants. We have watched other kinds of snakes arch their bodies to pass over ant columns. Notice the beautiful iridescent blue on the snake's scales as it glides silently away. Another reptile, a green iguana, is a vegetarian, and the ants and lizard ignore each other. The reason this gray and brown animal is called a green iguana is because its babies are the greenest of greens. No vertebrate eats many eseton army ants. Termites have large nests, bigger than basketballs, attached to trees. Termites sometimes emigrate to a new nest site, and they have large queens that would appear to be good food for army ants. Although termites are abundant, and one would expect some army ant to eat them, we have never observed this. We know that termites use defensive chemicals to protect themselves. Stingless bees are important insects in New World tropical forests. These bees have large colonies, usually on or inside trees. Some stingless bee nests have beautiful lacy entrance tubes made from pale yellow beeswax. The Burchellii run up the entrance tube, but they do not enter the nest or attack the bees. Stingless bees are occasionally attacked by army ants, and some species have an effective defense. They bring sticky tree sap out of their nest, dab it on the ants that get stuck in place, and die. When the ants climb up vegetation like this palm frond, they may find a wasp nest. In contrast to some stingless bees, we found no species of social wasp that can directly defend itself against an army ant attack. This nest contains over 100 wasps that remain inside most of the day. That makes the nest less conspicuous to birds and monkeys who like to eat wasp brood. The odor of army ants causes all the wasps to pour out of the nest before the army ants have started to attack. Look at the upper right corner of the screen. A few advanced army ant scouts are running along the thin stem. Some wasps grab an ant behind the head, fly off, and drop it. Dropping a very upset army ant bearing wasp odor causes more ants to rush up the vegetation. The wasps give up without a fight and fly away. 
After the wasps have evacuated their nest, the army ants march in, without any risk of injury from wasp bites or stings, and remove the defenseless brood. Here is a polistes nest, the kind of paper wasp that makes small horizontal combs common on buildings throughout the world. In the tropics, instead of having a horizontal comb, the nest gets much larger and hangs downward. We want to find out whether the army ants have to get on the nest or if their odor alone will alarm the wasps. The wasps ignore forceps held next to their nest. But when we put one ant between the tips of the forceps, the wasps attack the tips of the forceps even though they cannot see the ant. The whole colony then becomes alarmed by the army ant odor, and the wasps flee their nest before any ants get on it. This is important for the survival of the wasps. A wasp that does not escape quickly becomes a dead wasp. You can see the approaching ants through the leaf above the nest. At the time of attack, the wasps fly to a nearby leaf where they form a cluster. Scouts are sent out to find a new nest site. Dr. Martin Nauman, studying army ant raids with us, discovered that a marker wasp puts down a chemical trail by rubbing the tip of her abdomen on vegetation. When a good nest site is located, a series of marker wasps repeatedly put spots of chemical along the route to the new site. After the markers, a series of follower wasps show different behavior. They search with their antennae and do not rub their abdomens on the stem. This was the first discovery of chemical communication among adults of any social wasp. If the new site is accepted, the entire wasp colony rapidly flies along the trail to that site and starts to build a new nest. Since the wasp larvae and pupae are much bigger than most ant brood, they are easy to spot in a column. As we said earlier, no species of neotropical social wasps can by themselves successfully defend their colony from an army ant attack. Some species of social wasps search for trees with large colonies of Aztec ants. Here we see a large light gray nest made by Aztec ants. The dark areas in the nest show a nest built by wasps who cut out the inside of the ant nest. The tiny but very aggressive Aztec ants swarm on and around any army ant that attempts to climb the tree. In a scene reminiscent of Gulliver and the Lilliputians, the Aztec ants harass and pin down the army ants for hours. The result is, no army ant can get close to any wasp nest in an Aztec tree. The wasps pay back their protectors by defending the Aztecs from anteaters. The wasps successfully chase away any anteater that tries to climb the trees where Aztecs live. Here, a Tamadua anteater is making a hasty retreat. In some popular literature, army ants are said to, quote, eat everything in their path, unquote. Hollywood has even shown them destroying giant trees in a forest. A few species of army ants are known to feed on nut meats, but none eats any other vegetation. Although Eseton burchellii is frequently described as killing every arthropod it finds, that is also untrue. Many poisonous insects have bright red, yellow, or orange colors, which warn birds not to eat such insects. Blind army ants do not see these colors, but the ants detect the defensive chemicals and do not attack these insects. Scarab beetles are like giant military tanks that barrel through the raiding army. The ants run up to the beetle and back off as though they do not like the smell. The heavily armored beetle wanders off unharmed. Millipedes can walk directly through a column of ants. Most millipedes secrete highly toxic chemicals through pores along both sides of their body. Centipedes look similar to millipedes, but since they lack defensive chemicals, army ants eat thousands of them. Three to six workers carry this centipede in one piece back to the bivouac. Most caterpillars are also carried off whole. However, army ants avoid very hairy caterpillars. Spiders are some of the most common prey of Eseton burchellii. The largest spiders are tarantulas, but these are not captured. The numerous long hairs and quick shakes of the legs seem to protect tarantulas from attacks by army ants. Although most other spiders are quickly captured, this is one of the lucky escapees. A wolf spider is not so lucky, and is overwhelmed and then torn apart while it's still alive. Another spider manages to escape by running away while carrying her sack of eggs. Some caterpillars and spiders escape death by hanging down on silk threads while the raiding throng passes by. You can see the ants in the bottom right corner. Spiders are nice juicy food for army ants, and thousands are killed. 
Relatives of spiders, called amblypigids, are also eaten. Unless you are one of the rare individuals who love spiders and their relatives, you probably never heard of an amblypigid. These amblypigids are strong, with front legs enlarged to capture prey. They are active at night, and we find them as they creep around searching for prey on tree trunks or rocks. You are not likely to see one unless you creep around in tropical forests at night, a habit I recommend. They prey on insects, and we once saw one eating a frog. For some mysterious reasons we do not understand, army ants do not attack some amblypigids. This one remained motionless while ant raid columns passed by. Even when a daddy longlegs, sometimes called a harvestman, walked over it, it did not move. Perhaps this amblypigid made the mistake of moving. We know that movement can provoke attack. If we vibrate the stem of a plant, the ants will attack it, but they do not eat plants. The light-colored objects on the back of this amblypigid are her young. Watch closely, and you'll see the ants stealing her babies off her back. Eseton burchellii is raiding beneath this palm frond, where many isopods, also called sow bugs, have taken refuge. They stand calmly as if they know they have nothing to fear from burchellii. This species of army ant does not like the taste of sow bugs, at least it rarely captures any. A much smaller army ant, Labidus predator, has swarm raids that flow like floodwaters across the forest floor. Predator especially likes to eat sow bugs. These crustaceans react strongly when a swarm raid of Labidus predator approaches. Over 1,000 isopods are stampeding up this tree trunk to get away from a Labidus predator swarm raid. Their behavior suggests that isopods may release an alarm chemical that signals, run for your life. You are unlucky if you are a katydid, cricket, or a cockroach in a tropical forest. All these insects are frequently killed and eaten by army ants. This katydid is being pulled apart while it's still alive. The ants run up to this reddish katydid and do not attack. We think that the insect has some chemical that makes it distasteful or poisonous. Look closely, and you'll see that the katydid is pumping its abdomen. That's a lot of heavy breathing for a katydid that is scarcely moving. Perhaps it's pumping out a bad odor. Thanks to the army ants, we've discovered remarkable things about this katydid and other insects that we never suspected. A walking stick appears to be doomed as ants swarm all over it. The stick insect shows only the slightest movement during more than 15 minutes while the ants crawl all over it. Although we thought this stick insect was doomed, to our surprise, the ants left the walking stick and it walked away unharmed. This cockroach nymph survived only a few seconds in the ant swarm. The ants usually remove the legs first. That's a guarantee it will not escape. Here a large scorpion is being attacked. It has no way to tell where the ants are most dense. By chance it picks the right direction to run and escapes death. This scorpion is not so lucky. It runs from one group of army ants into a denser part of the swarm. By flicking its tail, the scorpion manages to remove a few army ants. Probably an alarm chemical from the ants attracts many more ants to join the fight. Even playing dead, the scorpion does not confuse the army ants. Soon the scorpion is pinned down. It takes over an hour for the ants to dissect the scorpion into pieces small enough to carry back to the bivouac. The sounds you hear are the actual sounds of the ants running on and attacking our microphone. At any given time during attacks on arthropods, most of the ants are running around apparently doing nothing. These are the army reserves. They are ready to attack if the prey escapes. They rotate or relieve other ants doing the attacking and dissecting. Even in human armies, most of the troops are not fighting. All armies have backup troops. If a prey is large or struggling, the ants will sting it. That either kills the prey or at least takes all the fight out of it. That protects the army ants from being injured by the prey. Although we're used to seeing animals eat with their jaws, this is not how army ants eat. Army ant jaws are not designed to cut. Their jaws are similar to pliers and not scissors. Watch and see that some ants gnaw at the joints while other workers tug until they get the prey divided into pieces small enough to carry. The jaws are used for holding or pulling on large prey like this scorpion. The jaws are used to pry the arthropods apart. Army ants actually eat with the tiny complex mouth parts that you can see between the large mandibles. We think that most adult army ants do much of their feeding on the juices leaking out of captured prey as the ants pry it apart. 
The army ants work really hard to get a scorpion divided into pieces they can carry. It looks like the ants are really struggling. This attack is a prime example of how raiding in a large swarm makes it possible for army ants to eat animals much bigger than themselves. It's easy to recognize the scorpion's dark stinger as the ants tug it around. Here the scorpion's front leg is carried home in a column. Parts of the scorpion's tail are also easy to recognize. A large worker is having a hard time carrying the tail segment. After she gives up, a much smaller worker carries it off in the wrong direction. The ants have a way to tell each other the correct direction to go. Here you will shortly see the same tail segment being carried in the right direction. There it comes. In this case, the strong flow of traffic from the right to left may be enough to turn the carrying ant around. A cricket leg is carried toward the new bivouac. A long leg of an amblypigid is apparently worthless, but still carried. We're showing it in slow motion. After it gets to the bivouac, it will be carried out and dumped in the refuse deposit. Here you see on a much weaker column, the ants carry a cricket leg in the wrong direction. Mysteriously, the ants communicate the correct direction to other ants. It's possible that the small eyes of the workers can detect sun direction, or maybe the ants have an internal compass. Raid columns extend up to 150 meters or 500 feet from the bivouac during the morning. When the ants encounter a nice smooth log, they usually adopt it for their highway. Some ants may run 150 meters out, and then the same 150 meters back to the bivouac, only to repeat that journey again during the emigration. If you magnify that to human scale, the ants are running the equivalent of two Boston marathons every day for two weeks. The main raid column from the bivouac gets subdivided into branching columns close to the swarm front. By 11 a.m., there are many thin columns mostly going away from the bivouac. Often, there's no prey to be seen. It's easy to conclude that these ants are very inefficient. You think they haven't caught anything. The ants climb up some vines or lianas as they are following the chemical trail of a prey species. We still do not see any prey. Then, a few minutes later, almost every ant is coming down with captured prey. The ants that seem to be carrying nothing probably have small prey under their bodies. Most of the prey are larvae or pupae of ants which are soft and easy for adults and larvae to eat. The army ants collect them by the tens of thousands. We usually do not see actual raids on ant colonies because they are hidden under leaves or inside tree trunks. These ants are exploring an ant nest inside this small hole. Even though they bring spider legs down from trees, these hard objects are discarded in the refuse deposits because the army ants cannot cut them open. We can tell that ants are being raided when we see workers running around carrying their young. This worker with giant eyes we found actually watching us and turning as we walk around the bush where it waits. Army ants do not eat tough adult ants, but this brown ant struggles and is killed. The raiding ants pour up some trees while ignoring adjacent trees. We suspect they are following either army ant trail chemical from a previous day or are following the trail of the prey species. It's known that Burchellii will repeatedly raid the same colony of carpenter ants throughout the year. We have never seen army ants kill an entire ant colony. They only harvest part of the brood and leave most of the adults to rear more ants for the next raid. Each of these dense clusters of army ants conceals one or more large carpenter ants that have been living inside the tree trunk. These carpenter ants are bigger than the Burchellii, and they attack many insects. We even found them killing a small frog. The attack is now over, and most of the workers are returning to the bivouac without prey. The clusters cover many adult carpenter ants that soon get carried back to the bivouac. That night, when the colony emigrates, the exodus of ants creates gaps in the bivouac through which you can see many shiny black and silver dead carpenter ants. The ants drop some of the prey and caches along the raid columns. This saves the ants the work of carrying prey many meters to the old bivouac and then carrying it again on the emigration to a new bivouac. It's a great energy-saving technique. It often saves an ant from carrying a heavy burden more than 200 meters. These piles of prey hold dozens of larvae and cocoons captured during the raid. The largest ant in Central America is called the bullet ant because you think you've been shot if it stings you. That is an exaggeration, but it still has the worst sting we've ever encountered. 
The ant is about two centimeters long. The giant ant wandered too close to a Burchellii raid column. It is attacked and killed, and then abandoned for some other predator to eat. Leafcutter ants carry pieces of vegetation above their bodies. The army ants always carry prey beneath their bodies. This leafcutter species is one ant that Burchellii will not eat. When their paths cross, the army ants pour ahead and cannot be stopped. When the army ants are emigrating and they meet a leafcutter column, they search for an overpass or underpass like we have on our automobile highways. After watching ants for hours, we are glad to have a pack of peccaries wander by. Since we're usually sitting quietly for hours, mammals and birds often do not notice us and we get startled as they come very close. A dolichodorous ant carries its larva in response to a different army ant, Eciton hamidum. The odor from only two hamidum workers causes alarm deep inside this subterranean dolichodorous nest. Suddenly the ants pour out of their nest, carrying their young. The ants flee in response to the odor of hamidum even before the attack has started. The ants flee more than 10 meters into the canopy. The army ants carry off any brood left in the nest. This prey species ignores the odor of Burchellii, which does not attack it. The Dolichodorus workers who rescue brood will return to their nests several hours later after the army ants have left. Although all nine species of Eciton eat primarily ant brood, no species of army ant kills another species of army ant or its brood. Some army ants, like this Niva myrmix, seem to specialize on eating only a few kinds of ants. The Eciton hamatum major in the center of this Burchellii raid column wandered into the column from a nearby hamatum raid. It is attacked, but it's not injured, and after many minutes, it escapes. A still photograph shows another example. The large Eciton rapax army ants at the top are stopped and held in place by the smaller Eciton hamatum army ants. We have never seen any army ant even injured by another army ant, regardless of their sizes. This suggests that army ants have evolved a more sophisticated type of warfare than humans. When two army ant colonies meet, one usually finds an overpass like this example where two emigrations cross. Shortly after noon, during the hottest part of the day, the ant raid slows down and may stop. Raid columns become very weak and difficult for us to follow. Often, two ants meet and touch antennae. We think they're communicating, but we do not know what they're saying or how they are saying it. Based on studies of other ant species, we can assume many chemicals are involved. Scientists who study the internal anatomy of ants state that each tiny ant has more different glands than are found in a human. From mid to late afternoon, ants start pouring out of this bivouac in large numbers. This is the first sign that an emigration may be starting. It's hard to know if it's exciting for the ants, but it is certainly exciting for us. Even after 54 years of following army ants, there's still a thrill to this moment when the emigration starts. When a new brood of adults emerges from their cocoons, the nomadic phase begins. These adults, called callos, are distinctly lighter in color than their older siblings. Their bodies have not yet hardened. A little later, when the emigration is going strong, the golden abdomens of the callos glow like tiny light bulbs. The reason you only see tiny callows is because the smallest workers emerge last. The bigger workers have already darkened. The eggs and the larvae being carried are so small, they're carried in clusters that we can just barely see. In only a few days, the larvae are so much bigger that almost everyone is carried separately. The larvae are carried by the same intermediate-sized workers that capture most prey. Regardless of the strength of the outgoing traffic, there are always a few workers going in the opposite direction. We assume these are important for communication. There are always a few guard workers along the edges of the column. These keep out most small creatures that might wander into the column. It is to the ant's advantage not to have any interruptions that will delay the emigration. As in all armies, some of the workers appear to be gold-bricking or doing nothing. Here, Julia Joseph, a field assistant, is following an emigration that began in the late afternoon. If we are lucky, the ants will start emigrating early, and then we can track the emigration by daylight. Often the ants are difficult to follow as they go under thick vegetation. We hope they do not go through a swamp or down a cliff. You can see why we prefer to track the emigration route during the late afternoon. 
Night comes quickly at 6 p.m. every day near the equator, and it's frightening to be caught here at night without a light. We put down a string along the route so we can find the colony the next day. It is very easy to lose a half million army ants in a dense tropical forest, and that string saves us a lot of time. Late emigrations can keep us up until midnight, and it's always a relief to finally locate the new bivouac. Even we human ant trackers have to get some sleep, so we can be up early to follow the next day's raiding. While tracking an early emigration in late afternoon, we come right next to a river that you can see in the background. On narrow stems and vines, the ants form flanges of living ants on both sides of the column. The flanges provide a good surface on which the ants can run easily and not fall into the river. In wet areas, the frog population can be so noisy that you have to shout to be heard above them. Sometimes, while tracking army ants, we're lucky to see an unusual animal, like this baby two-toed sloth. Adult sloths are the only land mammals that cannot stand up and walk. They have to claw clumsily across the ground. They do not eat army ants, but only leaves of trees. A sloth can move rapidly upside down in trees, and when soaking wet, it looks like a creeping wet rag floor mop. There are so many layers of leaves between the top of the forest canopy and the ground that we hear the thunderous rain hitting the leaves before it gets down to ant level. The army ants stay active during a hard rain. However, during the hardest rains, the ants hide under leaves or any shelter they can find. When the rain slows to a drizzle, the ants come out and link up the column again. Rain sometimes strikes the outer wall of the bivouac. The raindrops splash off the ants. Unlike the sloth, army ants really do not get wet. Rain bounces off the ants. The ants have a waxy surface, providing a permanent raincoat that sheds water. They cannot shake like a dog, but the water is readily shed as the ants scurry around. The heavy rainfall often causes frequent flooding. It's not unusual for a river to rise 10 meters or more than 30 feet during a single night. Floods occasionally cover the whole army ant bivouacs. Although people have reported seeing bivouacs floating down rivers, we have never seen this happen. There is only one queen in most army ant colonies. She is normally completely covered by a mass of workers. We isolated her in a laboratory nest so you can see how big she is. She's almost twice as long as the largest workers. No one has ever seen an army ant queen eat. She must feed or be fed within a mass of workers where we cannot see her. There are still many facts about army ants for future researchers to discover. We can identify a colony by marking the queen. The abdomen of this Eseton hamatum queen shows the tiny black spot on the first dorsal plate where we cut a slit to mark her. Marking has to be done in a laboratory with a microscope, good light, and very fine scissors like ones used to operate on human eyes. Carl Rettenmeyer is shown here marking a queen with tiny slits. We have no evidence that this hurts the queen. Using this technique, he proved that queens can live as long as five years in the field. During that lifetime, a queen may lay over five million eggs, one at a time. When emigrations are almost complete, we are alerted that the queen is approaching by a great increase in the number of workers running toward the old bivouac. Many soldiers are also running in both directions. The queen runs along accompanied by a constantly rotating retinue of dozens to hundreds of workers. We are first showing you a queen of Eseton hamatum in an emigration. That species is not as excitable or as aggressive as Burchellii. You can actually see the queen. A Burchellii queen typically is accompanied by many workers. We see only a boiling mass of workers moving down the emigration route. Beneath them is the queen. If you shine even the weakest of flashlights on her, she will stop and be covered by hundreds to several thousand workers and many soldiers. She may stay there for hours, or she may sneak out in a few minutes, leaving the mass of workers that fool us into thinking she's still there. At the end of the nomadic phase, the larvae are full-grown, and many silk cocoons can be seen in the last two emigrations. We can tell when the nomadic phase is ending when the larvae begin to spin cocoons. Since they cannot spin cocoons inside the bivouac, the workers carry all the larvae out and bury them in leaf litter on the forest floor. Cocoon spinning is an amazing gymnastic feat. Each larva has to spin silk threads and wrap them completely around its body. 
It does this by attaching silk from its mouth parts to bits of leaves and other debris around its body. After the larvae are completely enclosed in silk, the workers dig them out and carry them back to the bivouac. Even though there may be 100,000 new cocoons, we have never found that the ants overlook a single one. Back in the bivouac, each larva continues to spin until the thickness meets the larva's approval or the larva runs out of silk. The last nomadic emigration sometimes goes high up into the forest canopy. Esseton burchellii frequently makes a statory bivouac in the hollow trunk of a strangler fig tree. An emigration column leaving a bivouac on a vertical tree trunk usually has flanges of living ants. These flanges form a roadbed of ants which help prevent the ants carrying the heavy larvae from falling off the tree. The roadbed of ants continues across the leaf litter and provides a better surface for the carriers. This emigration has almost all cocoons, which suggests that the ants rejected the last bivouac site for their statory phase. Perhaps it was too exposed to air currents or rain. Sometimes statory bivouacs shift from one side of a tree to the other for reasons known only to the ants. The light cocoons gradually turn brown. A black spot shows up at the rear end. The spot indicates that the larva has molted and defecated. Ant larvae are peculiar in that they have a blind hindgut and cannot defecate until the larvae shed their skins inside their cocoons. That is a great adaptation for keeping the nest clean, and there are no diapers to change. While the colony has a cocoon brood, it does not emigrate, but stays in the same bivouac for about 21 days. That period is called the statory phase. During the statory phase, bivouacs are usually in sheltered locations, such as inside a hollow log or tree. Here, Scott Powell, a field assistant, is dissecting a statory bivouac to find the queen. The ants get upset and become more aggressive than usual. Scott is wearing leather gloves and has plastic bags around his arms and legs to protect him from bites and stings. Here's what he found. A pregnant or gravid queen laying eggs. This has never been filmed before, and few people have seen an army ant queen laying eggs. She will lay up to 100,000 eggs. She does that every 35 days for her entire life. This is an amazing task, and one hesitates to even consider the human equivalent. The smallest workers of a colony pick up and tend the minute eggs. By the time the queen finishes laying eggs, she has returned to her slender, contracted state. This allows her to emigrate without danger to the thin membranes between her abdominal segments. Her appearance will be transformed like this every 35 days for as long as five years. We are alerted to the end of the statory phase when we see empty cocoons raining down from the bivouac. For us, when the ants begin to move, it is time for us to prepare for nightly tracking of emigrations for the next two weeks. Since the number of colonies in our study sites seem to stay the same over the years of our work, between one and two million ants in each colony must die every year. The oldest workers probably die when one to two years old. Many are killed attacking prey, and we think that many get lost. If they fall out of a tree and lose their colony's chemical trail, they may not find their way back home and die alone. Colonies grow in size, and large colonies may divide into two parts, splitting like an amoeba. Unlike other kinds of ants, army ants can only produce a new colony via such budding. In order to divide, a colony must produce a sexual brood of about 2,000 to 4,000 males and one to several new queens, so that the new colony will have a mated queen. In contrast to the worker larvae that scarcely move, the male and queen larvae are constantly squirming. We think their activity causes the workers to feed them. When full-grown, each sexual brood larva is twice the length of the largest workers. These sexual larvae are difficult for the workers to transport. In spite of their size, the male and queen larvae complete their larval stage in less time than worker larvae. These larvae then spin their own silk cocoons at the end of the nomadic phase. Colonies that have a brood of male and queen cocoons typically form their statory bivouacs in exposed locations. Here is an example of a bivouac early in the statory phase. This is the same colony near the end of the statory phase. It seems to be busting at the seams with the new generation of reproductives. The male cocoons are in one end, and the queens are in the opposite end. The new queens emerge first from their cocoons. These queens are walking around several days before their brothers emerge. 
Over their lives, if they survive, these queens will walk about nine miles per year. For now, they just look for mates. We think that most queens mate with multiple males before their brothers emerge. This is the first photograph of mating army ants, taken in 1956 by Carl Rettenmeyer. For 50 years, we thought males had to shed their wings before they're capable of mating. Then, in 2005, Daniel Kronauer, a graduate student from the University of Copenhagen, studying the army ants in Venezuela, sent us the second photograph of mating army ants, in which the male clearly has his wings. The male cocoons attract many workers that cling to them even after the males have emerged. A few empty cocoons are even carried in the first emigration. Colonies divide into two more or less equal parts when the next nomadic phase begins. The old queen will have laid a brood of worker eggs, which are divided between the two colonies. Sometimes a new queen replaces the old queen. In other instances, she survives and one of her daughter queens moves off with the other half of the colony. The adult males are conspicuous in the emigration columns as the colony divides. On the early nomadic emigrations, the males are highly attractive to the workers, and two to six workers cling to each male in the emigration. After a few days, the males are capable of flying, and they disperse from their colony. If a male is extremely lucky, he will find a queen and mate with her. Most will die quietly in the leaf litter, having never mated. This method of starting a new colony by dividing a previous colony is rare among ants. It results in the strange consequence that all army ant colonies are immortal. Every colony has come from a previous colony going back over 100 million years. If a colony loses its queen, it will combine with another colony with a queen. The fact that colonies never really die must be part of the explanation for why army ants have more arthropods associated with them than any other ants. Colonies have had a hundred million years for their associates to invade and diversify. Some mites are so specialized that they only live on a specific surface of one small part of an ant's body. Just one species, Eseton burchellii, has about 300 different kinds of animals associated with it. We will show you a sample of those extremely diverse and bizarre animals in a later video.